These highly charismatic narcissists are able to make you feel very profound feelings, but that doesn't mean that they actually love you in the way that a normal person would recognize the word love. They can love you in the same way that someone might love their car. It's, it's conditional love. With a narcissist, the conditions are comply with everything they say, pay a lot of attention to them, don't criticize them. Their level of all the things you have to do before you get love are significant and unreasonable. The best option is to not have any relationship with a narcissist, going no contact. There were literally thousands of enablers around these people, constantly making excuses for them, lying about them, protecting them, cleaning up after them, in order for them to be able to carry on getting away with what they did. Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwin Robinson. And today we are continuing the conversation of narcissism and relationships. This is part two. So here we go. Well, you talked about spending time with a narcissist. What if someone's parent <laughs> is a narcissist? What kind of impact is that going to have? Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked earlier about I don't want to talk about my full history of narcissism for one simple reason. Um, and it's not because I'm afraid to, it's just because I don't want to create drama with certain people mm. from my past. Um, so I'll speak yeah. very generally and say that, you know, some of the early influences in my life were, I believe, full-blown narcissists, and that had a strong impact on me. Um, I would say a lot of people who I know are in a similar position to that. I don't think that's necessarily because everyone's parents are narcissist. I think people attract other people like them in many cases. So that's been my experience. So yeah, well, I, I made a lot of distinctions earlier about this is what they'll do if they have a position of power over you versus this is what they will do if they won't. So obviously when you're a parent, you have a pretty much limitless position of power over your child. Maybe a little bit less these days, the government being quite intrusive compared to before, but Still, it's a lot. Um, it's a hell of a lot. So yeah. everything I just said, the cycle of idealization, devaluation, discarding, and hoovering, imagine what that does to a, a child's development. One of the things, of course, that it can do is create another narcissist. But actually, quite common um, is a different type of personality disorder. Often borderline personality disorder can come about. Yeah, can you explain that borderline personality disorder? Um, it'll take a long time to explain, just like narcissistic okay. did, but just in terms of how it's relevant right now is one of the things that borderline people do is they go between extremes of feeling worthless and I understand because they've enough. got that history there, as you were saying, the attention, 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 neglect, 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 neglect. So they're constantly on, like you were just saying in that one conversation yeah. where you could go through it. So they're doing that. To the child. Uh, yeah. And, and going between <laughs> yeah. extremes of validation and invalidation, which, you know, creates this borderline people, unlike narcissists and psychopaths, I would say they're one of, if not the uh, most personal suffering out of all the different diagnoses like it really is very hurt, unpleasant to be a borderline personality disorder they go for a lot of suffering can somebody be both borderline and narcissistic uh i believe yes um they can switch between them some people would say no because of the nature of it like if you are borderline then you must be borderline and the narcissism is just part of the borderline so the borderline person okay. will go more between narcissistic behavior versus you know, collapsed, withdrawn, self-hating, self-destructive, you know, often threatening suicide, all of that kind of thing. Um, but, the, you know, the borderline person is also after attention. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're similar, right? This category, okay. B category, they all have some similarity. But they... Um, their life is chaos and drama way, way more and it, it, within themselves. So the narcissist is more creating chaos and drama for everyone around them, whereas the borderline person experiences that chaos and drama very intensely within themselves. And so I do believe that's often because they've you know, internalized what the narcissistic parent was doing to them that they then end up in this, you know, very unpleasant constant roller coaster of highs and lows. Mm. Um, so there are at least three different roles that a narcissistic parent will try and force you into 
and sometimes this will vary. Actually, before I get into that, let's look at what they you know, all have in common. So just as all people are tools to the narcissist, yes, even your own child is a tool to the narcissist. Now, another thing that's very true is superficial appearances. And so uh, narcissistic parents are often very focused on having everyone believe that they are good parents, especially their children. So there will be a full-blown propaganda campaign against the children to convince them that whatever the parent is doing is great often this is not necessarily nice you know like for instance i know you know my uh, distant relatives i think i can talk about them um the uh, great grandfather he was really focused on creating extremely authoritarian authoritarian kind of you know like um military kind of environment but there was still the propaganda that came with it is you're lucky because all these other kids, they don't have discipline like you do. And as a result of that, um, they're going to be weak and you know useless and stuff like that. So it's not necessarily I'm a nice parent, but it's like I'm a better parent than everyone else. And you're lucky to have me kind of thing. That's what they will always do in one form or another, unless they're the covert ones. And then it's the um, no, not even then they want to say that they're a good parent. But then it's like what a struggle it's been to be a good parent and how yeah. hard it's been for me. That's the um, what they'll tend to focus on. But yeah, they'll always want to be seen as good parents. Anyway, um, they will, yeah, they'll use children as tools. They won't really see them as real. They will invalidate their feelings. So one of the key things that you have as a result of having narcissistic parents is you often are unaware of your feelings and if you are aware of your feelings, you do not believe that they are valid. That's a classic sign of having a narcissistic parent. Um, your beliefs, your opinions, your thoughts, your preferences even, you know, about things that are innocuous, like, you know, what's better, chocolate or vanilla ice cream, right? Even those kind of preferences will be subordinated to the narcissistic parent. Whatever the narcissistic parent says is right. That's what goes. Yeah. Not just what goes, that's what's right. It's, right. it's beyond just behavior. It goes to a fundamental belief level um, that, you know, whatever religion or, you know, uh, uh, spiritual philosophy my parents believed in, um, whatever, you know, whatever they valued, whatever they prioritized, whatever political leanings they had, like, that's what's right, you know? Um, and so as a result of that, they narcissistic parents do not appreciate curiosity usually um, except for under certain circumstances they do not appreciate rebelliousness pretty much ever unless it's a very specific type of narcissist that is trying to create a specific type of child in fact yeah let's go to that so the three different roles that narcissistic parents try to drive child into are often known as the golden child, the handmaiden, and the scapegoat. So the golden child. The golden child is can do no wrong. Um, often, you know the way I said that a narcissist will um, identify with their idealized self? Yeah. So they will do the same thing for a child, but with one key caveat. They create the ideal for the child, and then they convince them that they are already it. You're so beautiful, you're so smart, you're so strong, you're so whatever, right? Now, you know, what if you don't care about being beautiful? What if you don't care about being smart? What if you don't care about being successful? What if you don't care about being better than everyone else in your class or whatever? That's no good. You may end up being one of right. the other types if you keep disobeying. But if you go along with it, Yes, mommy, I am. Yes, daddy, I am, you know, you know, talent, you know, best at this sport or, you know, more beautiful than anyone else or whatever it may be. If you go along with it, then you're the golden child. So the golden child often is a subject of envy of a lot of people, even of normal people looking at the relationships like, wow, she's really spoiling that child. You know, he's really spoiling that child. But actually, the golden child is in a very unpleasant situation where they have to suppress all their own authentic, natural feelings, thoughts, desires, beliefs, decisions, etc., to follow not even their own ideal, but the ideal that's being forced onto them by the parent. So while they are in a kind of privileged position, certainly from perspective maybe of other siblings who are not in the golden child rule, it's like they get all the attention, they get all the praise, they get all the support, they don't get 
insulted and invalidated regularly, but they have to constantly be a false self in order to um, maintain that privileged position. And so um, if they don't rebel against that, then they often become narcissistic themselves because they carry on living up to that ideal and then eventually that becomes their ideal. Maybe with some changes in augmentation once they become an adult and then they're stuck in that role of having to believe that they are perfect and superior and, and all the rest of it. Um, I, I, my parent tried to force me into that role, one of them, and I rebelled against that. Um, but they were always praising me and always supportive and everyone looked at me and was like, you're so lucky. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> I, it took me until understanding this to realize why I always wanted to rebel from that when you'd think that that would be a good thing. Because they were trying to suppress your own aspects, your own beings, the things that you intrinsically and authentically wanted for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. My own identity even, which yeah. includes that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so that's true for all the types I'm about to say yeah. that their identity is suppressed. It's just particularly, um, what's the word, seductive to fall into it with the gold and child. It's, it's difficult to escape. And the fact that I escaped is possibly because the other parent was so different rather than any credit to me. Um, but, you know, it is difficult to escape from because of that. Um, the next is the handmaiden. So the handmaiden is kind of like the servant or the slave. So they are the compliant one who does what they're told. Often they're put to work in one sense or another. And the difference with the golden child is even though they're also compliant, they are often treated badly. So nothing they do is ever good enough. You know, you didn't fold the laundry properly. You didn't wash the dishes properly or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you're not dressed, you know, smartly enough or whatever, like whatever they do, it's not good enough. Um, so they, so whereas the golden child tends to have mostly idealization, the handmaiden, um, will tend to have a lot of being told what to do and a lot of, um, uh, devaluation. And so it's like, and so you know, the kind of person who feels like they have to be perfect and nothing they do is ever good enough, that's often the person who's put into the handmaiden role. Um, the last type is the scapegoat. So this is, you know, also sometimes known as the black sheep. So <laughs> this is the cause of the problems in the family, designated cause. So what does that mean? Well, remember, narcissists don't want to take responsibility. So if a parent's narcissistic, um, there, and then, you know, maybe one child is a golden child, so it can't be their fault because they're perfect, right? One child's a handmaiden. Well, it's kind of their fault, but the crucial thing is the handmaiden is doing everything they're told. So as much as they are criticized, they can't truly be blamed for everything being wrong because they're only doing what they're told, right? That wouldn't make much sense, even with a narcissist twisted logic. So what you need is someone who is who does not go along with your commands, who can be blamed for everything bad. And that's the scapegoat role. Despite my rebelling, I was never really put in that role by my um, uh, parent who was narcissistic, by that parent. Um, but, you know, I've observed many others who were in that role. And often it is the one who can't help but telling the truth, like I had, who right. can't help but being defiant, who can't help but being rebellious. Um, who, you know, just blurts things out that the narcissist doesn't want, who just doesn't go along with the agenda. Mm. The interesting thing is that the narcissist kind of cultivates this. I remember, you know, another, you know, close family that I've been around for a long time. Um, this person had two children. One children was the golden child. The other one was definitely the scapegoat. And like, they were made into the scapegoat. This was constantly reinforced. You know, you're such a bad child. You're so disobedient. And of course, what happens if you keep telling someone that they are bad, that they are disobedient, that they are, you know, it's going to make them more that way, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. so those are the three types. And again, I would say um, probably neglect is the most important hallmark of the, uh, the scapegoat out of the, sorry, you know, discard to use that terminology, the third phase, um, because that's basically the attitude of the scapegoat is to throw them away, right? Like it's blame them, push them away. Whereas the handmaiden is always kept close to carry on doing chores. 
they yeah just devalue her she'll stay close because she'll be like oh okay let me try let me try <laughs> yes to get your, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when the scapegoat is okay. held up as the source of the problems and then kicked out right Okay. And this isn't always a child. This can be like I've seen dynamics where one child is the golden child, one child is the whole man and handmaiden, and then the partner is the scapegoat. That can happen, right? Or I've seen dynamics where the partner is the handmaiden, and then the children are the golden child and the scapegoat. Um, I've even occasionally seen dynamics where the partner is made into the golden child. And that's a lot more rare. Like they can do no wrong; they are wonderful, and then the children are handmaiden and scapegoat. But uh, I think that's really useful terminology, and I don't know if you. I won't ask you; it's very personal. But you know, you can think about where you might fit in with that, Chrissy. If you can relate to it, I know I, you know, thought about myself and where I fit in, because you can start to question, um, like everything that you believe is true and right and real in the world can be coloured by being having one of these three identities forced on you when you were a child by a narcissistic parent, and so breaking out of that is not particularly. Um, uh, easy to do and it's almost not possible until you recognize it so like understanding that more and recognizing it are very important if you suspect even if you don't know if you suspect you had a narcissistic parent i was going to ask because just in general i mean these seem these um roles as they're described you can see them in different dynamics are they only created by narcissistic people or can they also be created in other you know uh, you know, in other families per se, or anything else that, that it might come up? Well, remember, most people are some degree of narcissistic, but I would not expect an extremely low expression of narcissism in two parents to create one of those this level, types, right. unless it's mm -hmm. from someone else who's crucial, right? It's not always parents, especially depending on the culture, right? It may be grandparents right. who are making this happen yeah. or, you know, very prevalent uncles and aunts, um, but it's some kind of major authority figure in the child's life that you know probably they live with or has a family connection and i mean you you mentioned it i would this is really great distinctions of these things because then people can start thinking or identifying like oh wait a minute mm. i i identify with the handmaid you know, or the the scapegoat or something like that so just say for the scapegoat if you're always being yeah. blamed for things in your life in general you know in the office you're the scapegoat in your new friend group you're always the problem right that's you know very interesting and classic sign of it and that's same you know if you're whatever group you're in you're always the one looking after people you're always the one that's like you know being cooperative and you know doing what you're told that's this that's a sign that you had that childhood and also if you walk around and a lot of people praise you and say that you know you're amazing that's that, so whatever you this is like a or almost like a law of attraction type thing but whatever we expect to happen to us actually does happen to us a lot in our lives and we were often surprised when it's something different from what we expect, right? It's often, you know, you know, a shock or a stress. That reminds me that the other sign of having narcissistic parents, I would say, is like complex PTSD. So P PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is like where trauma is so bad that you haven't recovered from it. That's the simple uh, definition. Um, complex PTSD is where the trauma is not necessarily extreme, so you weren't necessarily violently raped, you know, you weren't necessarily beaten half to death or any of these crazy things that happen to far too many people. But there was this constant pervasive sense of stress and never being able to relax and never feeling safe um, in your childhood. And that's more the kind of thing that leads to complex PTSD. And it's just as damaging in its own way. So. Like stress can either be chronic or acute, yeah. So you could have had a wonderful child, childhood, wonderful parents, and all that, but then you know you were kidnapped and raped and brutalized, and you could be traumatized for the rest of your life. On the other hand, you could never have something bad, ha so bad happen to you that it would make a, a story like they would never make a movie out of it, and yet your life was constantly filled with, you know, I must be perfect or else, or you know, I, I, all the stuff we've really talked about. And just that constant feeling of threat, even if it's rarely backed up, let's say you're a golden child and you're rarely punished, just the constant threat of I must go along with or else can put you in a state where you're in a chronic state of tension. And so that's why I think, you know, most people with narcissistic parents are uh, very anxious, often depressed because of the devaluation aspect of it, anxious because of the roller coaster element of the relationship. Um, and very often addicted to drama and stress because, again, to them, anything other than that 
feels boring. This is why people with abusive parents usually end up in abusive romantic relationships because it's what they know. It's what they know. It's, that's yeah. And if they're in a non-abusive one, it will feel boring and unfamiliar. So it's the unfamiliarity, but it is also the boredom that they have to get right. over. Like learning to rewire the chemistry so they feel good without being stressed. Let me ask you this, um, because I think as well, there could be many people that are like, yeah, but my childhood was great. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents love me, you know, because then this is going to lead me into that next question. You know, how does somebody understand? Well, it's going to be a little bit of a two-parter, like looking back on going like, oh, wait a minute, maybe I was highly manipulated by a narcissistic parent or maybe somebody today is in that relationship and you know it's like how can somebody really figure out if they were manipulated by the by a narcissist well you know the saying like if you show up to a psychiatrist asking if you're insane you're probably not right <laughs> so i would say actually ironically a hallmark of this is if you're willing to honestly explore the possibility of curiosity it's much less likely to be true. If you're, if you have a knee-jerk reaction of no, that's not my parents. That they're not like that. They're great. That actually indicates to me a much higher chance that they were narcissistic. Why? Because a narcissist, because a person brought up with normal parents is happy to explore options and possibilities, just like a non-insane person is happy to explore the possibility that they may be crazy if you know they're doing something a bit weird or something a bit weird happening or something like that whereas someone who's totally insane is very very convinced that they're not and that it's everyone else and it's the same with this if you had narcissistic parents you're very very convinced that your parents are wonderful generally unless you were the scapegoat but if you were the golden child or the handmaiden which is more likely now if you're the scapegoat you may be open to the fact that they were uh, narcissistic but you may still not it depends on that balance that i said earlier like of when you are rejected are you focused more on resentment or are you focus more on the longing if you're right. focused more on the longing then you will hold this idealized view of your parent in your mind that they very strongly created for you and you know attempted to maintain for you because remember as much as they're trying to convince you that you're you know the problem in the case of scapegoat or that you're not good enough and have to work better in the case of a handmaiden what they're trying to convince everyone of is how great they are <laughs> right mm. and in case of parent what a wonderful parent they are and so even if you're a scapegoat you may have still fallen for the propaganda campaign um and so yeah i'd say the first step is just to be open to questioning it right go through the list and know that the di more difficult that is for you then the more chance there is that it is actually true it's very unfortunate, but it just is the way it is. Of course, you can get other people's opinion on it, right? Uh, I found it helpful to talk to a qualified and experienced therapist about my experiences and hearing what they thought. And they said, you know, obviously I can't give a diagnosis to someone who isn't present, but it sounds like it, right? And you go, oh, okay then. Mm, yeah. Um, and so, you know, you can have something similar like that. You can get uh, an opinion from someone who is impartial not a diagnosis but you can get an opinion from someone who's impartial um and who understands these concepts it's that period i guess of of reflection of let's say somebody is so immersed in the propaganda yeah i had a good childhood a great childhood my parents really love me and then they start to unravel look back and unwind it or potentially with talking to somebody that's qualified then i mean then that opens up the whole journey yeah there in and of itself there's a thing called a fantasy bond it's a very long book by an author i don't remember right now um but i'm sure if you put fantasy bond in amazon it would come up and he writes about what what is the fantasy bond the fantasy bond is so the ironic thing is the more insecure your childhood was maybe because of you know this roller coaster dynamic so you never felt secure um the more you have a tendency to build a fantasy of that your parents are wonderful parents, that your childhood was a loving, you know, happy childhood. And the more that you defend that fantasy from your own thoughts and other people's, you know, thoughts, because facing the truth that your parents maybe weren't capable of being good parents because of what they are, um, would just be too devastating. I mean, it's a pretty awful realization that I, you know, personally had to go through that 
this person who you we're hardwired literally hardwired before we're born genetically to believe that our parents especially mothers should unconditionally love us and so to face the reality of that actually wasn't really the case or the type of love that a narcissist has is so it's not the type of love that we're hardwired to want and feel satisfied by let's just put it that way <laughs> without any judgment so um it, it's very hard to face that and it's much easier to believe the propaganda and live in a delusion that you know gas i keep using the word propaganda but i guess gaslighting is the term usually used to believe that than to accept that we weren't loved to accept that we are and and even worse because with the narcissist thing it's not just that you weren't loved by that parent it's that you never will be they're never going to be capable right. of it or as they are, there's nothing you can do to make it happen. I was going to say that because that's my next question really is, is we discussed empathy, we discussed things like that. But, you know, can a nar narcissist ever really have any, you know, empathy or real true feelings <laughs> towards someone? Um, yeah, so, well, they won't have the feeling of shame, as we talked about earlier. <laughs> um yeah, so and I mean also too in like the sense of like love. I mean maybe they love somebody in their own way or like are they re even capable of that? They yeah, they can love you in the same way that someone might love their car or they love their pet or something else that they objectify. But they can only really love you as an object. And you know, when mm. I say that, this sounds like often something that women complain that men do to them, objectify them. And in fact there's some truth to this. So um According to all the current tests anyway, uh, narcissism is more common among males than women, just like so psychopathy is more common among men than women. Now, there are still plenty of women. It's not like 90-10. It's maybe more like 60-40. Right. There are still plenty of women that, happen, that have it. And I think, if anything, it's when women have it, it's more damaging if they become parents because of how utterly dependent a child is on the mother and influenced by the mother. Um, but still, it is more common among men. Um, and uh, sorry, it is yeah, more common among men. And yeah, so it's that tendency to objectify you. So they love you as, you know, there's that um, term trophy wife, right? So does a rich old guy love a trophy wife? Um, maybe, but not if they're narcissistic. And so that's the kind of the, um, what's the word? The um, cliche, but kind of the important thing to understand is that to a narcissist, every wife and every husband is a trophy wife for a trophy husband, <laughs> right? And they may be a right. lot more. They may be, you know, a source of a lot of other things other than status. I guess that's the idea of trophy or status. But fundamentally, you're an object. So they can love you as much as they can love an object. But, you know, it's, it's conditional love. That's the crucial thing. It's always conditional. What's it conditional upon? It's conditional upon... Now... You could say all love is conditional, at least among adults, right? Conditional on someone not being abusive towards you, conditional on someone not being violent towards you. Fine, that's fair enough and that's reasonable. But with a narcissist, the conditions are, you know, that you pay a lot of attention to them, that you, um, you know, don't criticize them, that you um, comply with everything they say um, and think and feel and, you know, ask you to do. Um, it, it's a big list, right? So with, I guess, the, the healthy form of um, uh, boundaries in a relationship is, you know, like to treat me with a certain level of respect and kindness and then not to be abusive and stuff like that. But um, t with, with a narcissist, it's way more than that, right? So their level of all the things you have to do before you get love are significant and unreasonable from any kind of you know healthy psychologically healthy perspective so are they capable of love it depends on your definition as as we've always right, right? um they're ca are they capable of making you feel loved yes absolutely are they capable of making you feel sp special yes are they capable of making you feel profound even spiritual and religious experiences yes and i think that's one of the reasons why um, you know, we talked about gurus and spiritual leaders and religious leaders earlier. I am not surprised that these people who, I mean, there's a recent one, was it John of God, who is this spiritual healer person in Brazil? He, he you know, was um, 
killing loads of babies and breeding babies to sell them. It's just horrific human trafficking, murder. And he was promoted by Oprah Winfrey. He had a huge following. Do I believe that he managed to make people feel something very, very special um, that they might have felt was a spiritual or religious experience? Yes, I definitely do. Um, I, I don't think that all these people, like including very powerful, successful people like Oprah, are all completely delusional. I think that, um, you know, these highly charismatic narcissists, for whatever reason, I won't speculate about that in this episode, um, are able to make you feel very profound feelings, including ones that would be considered spiritual or religious. But that doesn't mean that they actually love you in the way that a normal person would recognize the word love, which is care about your well-being just because. Be willing to sacrifice themselves for you. That's a key word right there. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I could have put that earlier. Sacrifice is more of an action than a, than a virtue. But yeah, yeah. Um, be willing to um, put you first above themselves genuinely, not just as a you know, temporary manipulative uh, tactic, you know, those kind of qualities of love, being willing to forgive you, even if you profoundly hurt them, not just because they, you know, you, they judge that you're a valuable resource, but just because they love you, right? Those kind of things. If you're expecting that kind of love, you're going to be disappointed over and over again. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Conversely, you know, if somebody is in a relationship or has a relationship like, well, that could be romantic or it could be with their parent, can they ever have a fulfilling relationship with that narcissist? Like if that person's not going anywhere, how can they successfully navigate it? So what I'm going to say now is probably the most controversial thing of all, but what's generally agreed upon in the narcissist community, including all the mental health professionals who help people, with narcissism and with overcoming the abuse of narcissistic people is that it is not possible. They cannot have truly healthy, fulfilling relationships because all relationships to them are fundamentally transactional. And so, you know, Dr. Ramini, for instance, she says she has not all her clients are like survivors of narcissistic abuse. Some of them are narcissists. And she has to help them too, right? And she right. says when she right. when she helps narcissists, what she encourages them to do is to n actually only maintain superficial um, transactional relationships because that's the best they're going to manage. And at least if that's clear and obvious to everyone, then it's kind of better than if one of them, you know, so it's better to pay someone to be your boyfriend or girlfriend than to make them fall in love with you, right? as a narcissist, like, because at least that's right. honest, the, 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 the first option and pay you, you know, it may not be money, it may be gifts, it may be trips, it may be, I don't know what it, you know, but the point is, if it's honestly, authentically transactional on the surface, she argues, and I would tend to agree with her, that's actually better because then at least both parties know what they're getting into. There's a great TV show that Dr. Ramini says um, is actually better than she, she she believes the people who wrote it have a better understanding of narcissism than her and it's the tv show succession oh my god yes e every every <laughs> character there is uh narcissistic almost pretty much and 
a lot of what we talked about, if you feel like it doesn't relate to you or if you can't bear the idea of relating it to you, you can relate it to a TV show um, like Succession. Those writers uh, also, I think, wrote comedies like uh, Fresh Me and uh, Peep Show. And again, they were very narcissistic people. So I don't know if they're narcissists very explaining their experience well or if they are if they have just a great insight into narcissism but um anyway i bring that up to say um that you know in that case in the, they display the narcissism perfectly in that series because there is no um resolution right no redeeming and also i remember yeah. watching and i love the show i loved it my husband and i watched it it's like there's not no one in here has any really redeeming <laughs> qualities like i mean because and that's hard to write because usually i'm like i'm not emotionally connected to somebody i'm like oh that show's done for me but you just couldn't stop watching <laughs> and it was hard to watch at times as well but well yeah. they have no redeeming qualities absolutely right and there's no redemption right normally yeah. In a character arc, arc, if a main character or main characters are bad in some way, they go through this process of redemption or improvement or evolution, and there's none. They just stay awful the whole time, probably even degenerating over time in many cases. Now, there's one character, I think called Connor, who's kind of um, uh, a little bit less narcissistic than everyone else, kind of checked out, although he is in his own way. He's more the immature narcissist, maybe, in terms of what we talked about earlier um the uh, the low grade narcissist yes and and he has this transactional relationship right he buys yes totally woman. and and she's aware that's going what's going on he's aware that's not what's going on she's not that happy about it but she's willing to do it he's happy with it and that's the point he's genuinely happy with it and again that's true to life a narcissistic person is genuinely happy with a transactional relationship as so long as they feel like they're getting a deal right as long as what they're getting is less than they're paying or, or, you know, yeah, ideally really less. <laughs> Otherwise, they won't be happy. Um, as long as they, <laughs> what they're getting is more than what they're paying for it, um, they, they're, they're satisfied. Um, they, don't need, now they don't need it. Um, and in fact, you know, especially a malignant narcissist who's constantly looking for enemies, uh, you know, around every corner, um, they're really better off without any close personal relationships because there's no one who they won't make them miserable with their right. with their paranoia and their hostility um but I, yeah absolutely all types so the best option is to not have any relationship with a narcissist and so th they call this in the community they call this going no contact and so this is not something you can necessarily do overnight um, but this would be your goal now there are certain situations and i would say and i've believe Dr. Ramani would say way less than most people would think, but there are certain situations where it's not possible to do that. An example might be if you have children together with someone who's narcissistic, um, you're going to have to have some interaction with them. Now, obviously, if someone is a parent or a brother or a sister or an uncle or aunt, whatever, depending on your culture, you know, social convention would generally tell you that you can't completely go in no contact with them. Um, I think it's interesting that Dr. Ramani actually, you know, comes from um, a non, you know, European background. I would say that U Europeans are the most willing to break family connections out of all the different cultures. And yet we're, we're still not very willing. It takes a lot. But, you know, many other cultures, they, you know, it's the, the worst thing you could possibly do is to, you know, break contact. Now, ironically, the only people who often do do this is narcissists, right? They'll, <laughs> they'll have some kind of grudge against someone else, especially if they're both narcissists, right? And then, you know, they might be brother and sister or father and son or whatever, and they won't speak to each other in 40 years. Um, but generally, non-narcissists feel a huge amount of pressure to maintain family relationships, despite the fact that it is a bad idea through any objective lens, just through you know, the combination of even without, let's say they've seen through all the propaganda and let's see they've genuinely committed to living a life of harmony and, you know, peace and enjoyment rather than a life of excitement and stress and roller coasters and drama. Even in that case, uh, there's still a lot of guilt and shame and fear around ending a relationship with someone, a close family member. I mean, there's other situations. If your boss is a narcissist, you should definitely get leave that job. And there could be a lot of pressure with there, right? Oh, I'm not going to find anyone else who pay me that much. Or I'm not going right. to be able to find a job at all. Or 
I'd have to move and I don't, I can't move. I don't want to move, you know? So, you know, no matter what the relationship, coworker, you know, quote unquote friend, um, there can all, there, there is always potentially reasons why it is very difficult to remove yourself from them. But again, as I said, there are very few instances where I believe that are genuine, but sharing a child with a narcissist would be one of them. Um, and then the strategy that's recommended generally is to do what they call going gray rock. And gray rock terminology means that you uh, become as unreactive as you possibly can be. So if you have to communicate with a narcissist, you do it you do not volunteer any information and you do not react to anything that they're saying. So it might be like, you know, what time are you meeting? What time are we meeting? Or what time are we handing over the kids? Okay, two o'clock. They might try and bait you with something, ignore them. Okay, so two o'clock at this address, right? Yes, okay. They may then try to make you feel sorry for them, ignore them. Okay, I'll see you then, click. It's that kind of thing, right? right? And it's very difficult to do because of course they know how to push your buttons. If you're someone who they can get with, pity and guilt then they'll do that if there's someone who they can get through intimidation and then they'll do that if there's someone they can get through sedu seduction they'll do that if there's some if you're someone who they can get through bribes they'll do that etc right they, if there's a way to get to you they'll do it um but gray rock is really practicing and the people who handle narcissists the best who are not narcissists but handle them they're the people who for whatever reason are best at doing that naturally they just don't react to the narcissist. They don't let them get to them. They don't get involved with them. They happily put up a boundary. So they might just say, okay, yeah, I've got to go now. See you later. Right. Rather than being guilted into staying or intimidated into staying or whatever. Like, yeah, hard to do if it's your mom. <laughs> <laughs> much harder in that case, as I say. <laughs> uh, much, much but, harder. Yeah, much harder, but still. A skill yeah. worth learning. Yeah. And so I would say, you know, Again, if we were to say that everyone, you know, let's be religious for a second, say, you know, God's created everyone for a purpose, God created evil for a person, God created narcissistic people for a purpose. What is the benefit of having a narcissistic parent or whatever, anyone? Well, one of them is that you can see how they try and get to you and attempt to grow beyond it, right? Growth. Yeah. Yeah, growth. Now, of course, you've got to be careful with that. Um, in the case of if they guilt trip you, for instance, we want to make sure we don't grow above guilt, right? Because then that's making ourselves into a psychopath. So we want to um, make a very clear distinction, not between, oh, I'm ruthless, I don't care about people suffering because I'm so sick of, you know, hearing about your fake suffering or maybe it's genuine, but it's manipulative. And be like, you know, I care about your suffering and yet I'm not getting involved because I know this is a manipulative strategy and not a real call for help right so that's the, the distinction yeah. to it's very very difficult but to still care so to kill still keep your own humanity don't lose your own humanity um while being ruthless really with them because th in the same way you want to care about the well-being of everyone but you know, despite that fable, if you see a, say, a tiger with a thorn in its paw, you don't actually want to go and pull it out because it will probably just eat you afterwards, right? It's not going to be great for and protect you from now on. That's a fantasy. The reality is it's much more likely to eat you. There's that story about the fox and the scorpion, which I'm sure you've heard before, but I'll repeat again because it really, um, you know, sums up. I think it's about psychopaths, but I think it's really equally true about narcissists. So uh, Fox uh, is about to cross the river. I'm doing a short version. And uh, Scorpion says, um, can you help me cross the river? Fox says, uh, oh, I'm, I'm wary to do that and to get near you because you're a scorpion. You sting people. And the scorpion goes, don't be silly. If you let me cross over the uh, river on your back, why would I sting you? Because then we'd both drown. And the Fox thinks about it. He goes, oh, yeah, good point. Why would you do that? Okay. And he agrees to take him across. He feels safe because why would the scorpion do it? And then halfway across, the scorpion stings the fox. The fox says, what have you done that for? Now we're both going to draw on. And the scorpion says, it's in my nature. We have to really appreciate and understand that story, not just to deal with psychopaths, but to deal with narcissists as well. No matter what they say and no matter what even you might believe their genuine intentions are, they will always fundamentally revert to acting true to type. 
which is everything that we've talked about. And so it's your choice. Like, I would say, all right, put, let's put it this way. If you keep these people in your life, it is an act of sacrifice. So you could look at that in a positive sense. You could be a martyr in a positive sense. But it's an, actually an act of sacrifice that benefits no one. So, and I'll tell you why. Because narcissists would not really be able to function in society without another category of people. And that category of people is called enablers. So an enabler is someone who allows an, the narcissist behavior and makes excuses for them. They will often do that for other people. So for instance, you talked about, you know, um, you can't not speak to your mother. Well, okay, let's say that your mother acts particularly atrociously towards your children and that pushes you far enough to be protective of them and you decide to cut her off, right? Well then, and again, this is all made up. I don't even know if you have, uh, but let's say your brother comes along and he starts going, oh, you know, mum doesn't mean it. She means well, um, you know, it's just the way she is. You should forgive her. You shouldn't be so selfish. You should be a good daughter, all this kind of stuff. That's an enabler. Right. And the truth is, if those enablers didn't exist, if there were no enablers, narcissists would not be able to get very far in their strategies of manipulating people. If, you know, even if everyone was only either innocent or wary, that would be okay. It's the enablers that keep this going. And so there are a classic example of this, like, you know, your Harvey Weinstein. I mean, you know, he may be a psychopath for all I know, but people who act in this predatory way, right? I mentioned him for a reason because, you know, and, and, and you know, a British version of that would be Jimmy Savile, right? Mm -hmm. pred pre yeah. Both sexual predators. But the key point that I want to point out is there were literally thousands of enablers around these people constantly making excuses for them, lying about them, protecting them, cleaning up after them in order for them to be able to carry on getting away with what they did. And while a case like Jimmy Savile and um, uh, Harvey Weinstein might be really obvious cases of, you know, obvious, extremely criminal activity, um, this is actually true of all narcissists. The only possible chance that a narcissist might change through some act of you know divine intervention that i see is if they get absolutely no supply and supply is what is referred to as the resource that they want which is the type of attention that they want so if literally everyone either goes no contact or gray rock with a narcissist and everywhere they go no one's falling for it. No one's buying into it. Everyone ignores them or kicks them out or whatever. Then they may come to a crisis point of, oh my God, I need to change my ways. But the point is that almost never happens. And the problem is that that almost never happens. Why does it never happen? First of all, because there's a fresh supply of new victims, right? The, the say, always. <laughs> there's, a, there's a sucker born every day, that saying. But I think that the more key thing as I said, is the enablers. Because there was, if there was only innocent people and then everyone else was wary and, you know, well-informed, then the well-informed people would just, you know, warn the innocent ones. It's the enablers that are the problem. They're the ones who keep it going. And I would actually also argue that morality-wise, going back to, you know, morality and evil for a second, in a way, in an important way, an enabler is actually more guilty and more evil than a narcissist or a psychopath. And here's why. Because it's probably because they have their conscience about them and they're allowing it. Yeah, because if it's true that a narcissist and definitely a psychopath cannot get better, then in a way they're right when they say it's not their responsibility, right? Because they have no choice. If you, if they can't change, in a way they're right. It's not their fault. That unfor that doesn't let them off the hook for their behavior. No, unfortunately. exactly. That's not. Yeah, it's not what we're saying. But philosophically, <laughs> it's still true. If it's impossible to not be the way you are then you are at least less responsible for your actions. That's, you know, you can tone them down, admittedly, right? So you're partly responsible because you could tone it down, but you're never going to stop. And that's where you're not responsible. An enabler absolutely can change their ways. They absolutely could stop doing that. And then they choose not to. So it's like that saying, you know, um, the world falls apart, 
not when um, bad people do bad things. The world falls apart when good people do nothing. Mm, so it's yeah. that distinction. So evil people are going to evil. Psychopaths are going to psychopaths. Narcissists are going to narcissist. It's the people who go along with it and make excuses for it and make it easier for them to behave that way. They're the people who are actually most responsible. Let's say this individual, an individual is in this relationship with a narcissist. They've identified it's toxic. They know they want to get out of it. How do they escape this relationship, this toxic relationship with this person? What are the steps they take? I like the fact you used the word escape because that's exactly how I put it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I've I've really narrowed this down to four steps. I don't know if I've subconsciously copied this from Dr. Ramani or if it's my own system. So credit, if someone wants to tell me I got it from somewhere else, I'll happily credit them. Um, so first step is full awareness. You have to be super, super clear about everything that I talked about. If you have doubt in your mind, if you go back and forth, then you haven't done this step yet. You have to read enough, talk to enough people, watch enough YouTube videos, listen to enough, whatever it might be. You need to get sufficient education to not just be open, but to be convinced. And if you haven't done that, then it, it, the rest are not going to work. You have to be really, really, really clear that this is the case. You don't have to have a maniacal kind of 100% certainty like a narcissist, certainly, but you need to be like 98% sure, you know? You, you, by all means, leave that room, that little bit of doubt that humility allows for you, but be pretty sure, sure enough that you're not going to shake in this. Okay, and of course, if you can't get there, maybe because you're wrong. You know, it's very easy with this narcissistic thing to be throwing labels around at other people. And probably actually what's going on is you've got narcissistic traits and so do they. <laughs> um, and I see that a lot. And you're both just, you know, accusing each other of narcissism and you're both kind of right and you're both kind of wrong. You're both right that you're both doing what you're doing and you're both wrong that it's not really full blown in either case. So we want to watch out for that as well. So, yeah, first of all, I'll answer what to do if someone is definitely a full-blown narcissist, then we'll talk about if they just have traits. So, have full awareness. Number two, do not call them out on it. This is extremely difficult to do because after, it's, it, you know, first of all, it's extremely difficult to become aware for all the reasons we talked about earlier. But then once you become aware, it's extremely difficult not to tell people about it, especially them right? I see what you're doing. I'm not falling for it anymore. Da, 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 da. Why does it not work? Um, all you're going to get, all, all you're going to do is get a big reaction, right? You're going to get denial, obviously, because being this evil person or selfish person even does not comport with their idealized view of themselves. So you're going to get defensiveness. You're probably going to get a counterattack. You might well get a counterattack that's a lot stronger than your initial attack in the first place. And would it also then also be potentially risky because then the narcissist could re-manipulate the situation yeah. and then you're hooked right back in. So then you were kind of on your way out, but no, you're a little bit further back in. 100%. 100%. So they will involve you in some kind of confrontational argument about it. And you will be highly emotional engaged with them. You'll be paying a lot of attention to them and they will still be getting their supply off you. So telling them that you, know, and now here's the other problem. Not only do you not want to tell them that you know, you actually don't even want to let them know you know subtly. Mm. So you have to be really careful. What often happens is people who, a lot of people will not say anything, not because they know any of this, but just because they don't want a confrontation, right? That's very common. So, but then you start treating the person differently. You start maybe avoiding them a bit more. You start giving shorter answers. You start, you know, changing the subjects when they try and antagonize you rather than falling for it. And then at some point they're gonna ask you, what's up? What's wrong with you? Like some version of that. Are you okay? Even they might say, they might act like they're worried about you. Um, it's very important even at that stage to not admit what's going on, to admit you know what's going on. It's very important actually until you can escape to not let on what's going on, that you, that you get it. Try and actually go through the motions of acting fairly normal. 
Um, so that's step number two. Do not call them out. Do not let them realize. This involves a level of deceit in a way and not speaking your truth, which a lot of people like me find very uncomfortable. So it's up to you. You may not want to do it, but it's it doesn't help. It only, as you so correctly said a minute ago, Chrissy, it only helps them and goes into their plan to point it out to mm. them because it's just more drama, more uh, of the usual cycle. So step number three, I would say, is plan your escape. Plan how you're going to get out. You know, if it's a boss, you're going to find a new job, right? If it's a partner, maybe divorce or whatever it might be. If it's a family member, what, you know, needs to happen, right? If you're still living with them, you probably need to move out, you know, basic stuff like that. Um, so, you know, often, yeah, that's how we're, you know, we're, we're connected through finances, we're connected through work, we're connected through um, children, you know, so these things have to be worked out, these practicalities. You can't just, you know, if you are tempted to get on your high horse and make a big scene about it and not prepare and not be practical, then you may not be one, but you're kind of acting, you know, narcissistical borderline when you're doing that. That's not what you want to do. If you actually want to be free of the roller coaster, if you actually want to, uh, you know, just live a peaceful life, a harmonious life, then you've got to do it the way I'm saying. So you plan your escape. Again, if you can escape, if you can't, right. then it's the great, then you plan for when you're going to go gray rock. Again, do you want to go gray rock immediately? No. What, if you're still in business with each other and seeing each other every day, if you're still married, that's not great, right? You go to a therapist yeah. and the therapist is going to go, well, you know, why are you acting so cold and distant, right? It's going to be like, you're the problem. So you've got to prepare even to do that, but ideally you're preparing to escape. And then number four is ruthlessly execute. And that's where you do need to have ruthlessness, you know? You need to, you know, maybe one day you move out and, you know, you're a divorce lawyer and let's say if they've been really abusive, you need to do a restrain, restraining order or whatever, right? You, you need to push it as far as is necessary. Um, you need to block them on your phone, on your social media, all of that kind of stuff, right? There can be no half measures. Do you want? Do you need to explain yourself to them? You can do. Um, that's up to you. Just so that they don't think that you might have died or something like that, right? If they suddenly don't right. hear from you, depending <laughs> on the situation. But is it ideal if a lawyer does the explaining for you? Probably. You know, if it's a case of a divorce or a business breakup or something right. like that. Like, if you don't say anything personally yourself, that's probably um, ideal. And so that's really what you've got to do. There's another question. Is it? Is there any point doing couples therapy with a narcissistic person? No. Yeah, great question. I was going to say, you kind of <laughs> answered that in the question before. We kind of have all that understanding because it sounds like as well, no matter what your point is or what you say, it's almost as if it's wasted breath because they're really never going to be able to take it on board or make any kind of changes. They will only take it on board to the degree that it serves their purposes and allows them to get resources from you that they want, but they'll never take it on board in any genuine way. Yeah. Right. And so if you do couples therapist, unless the therapist is very skilled which some of them are but uh -huh. they will often you know at least initially manipulate and you know charm the therapist and they'll make it seem like you're the problem of course and all this kind of thing they may well suddenly say to the therapist oh i know that i do this wrong and that wrong and you're like I, 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 <laughs> i've never heard you, <laughs> you mean do? that in your life but they'll say it because they know it'll help to you know manipulate the therapist and get a reaction right. out of you and then you'll seem like the crazy one it's like right. a whole thing now i say all that to say if they're not a full-blown narcissist, then couples therapy could be very, very helpful. Because, you know, what are the alternatives? All right, so one option is you can see therapist to help you to navigate dealing with that person who has narcissistic traits better. That's good. That's also a good idea. You can tell them that they need to see a therapist because they're narcissistic traits. That's not good. They're going to react poorly to that. Um, they're going to feel like you're blaming them, which may well be unjust because you may not be seeing your own issues, your own problems. Um, and, you know, they're going to feel like you're scapegoating them, which is a narcissistic thing to do in itself. So that's also not good. Um, so, and then, you know, if they understand the term as well as you, there's going to be a lot of back and forth accusing each other of narcissism properly. Um, so much better to go to a couples therapist 
and you know come there with the explicit intention of relating to each other better which is usually what a couples therapist is focused on and then the narcissistic traits are what's going to stop you relating to each other better than you already are whatever that level is you know so the degree that you are arrogant the degree that you feel entitled the degree that you lack self-awareness the degree that you're not taking responsibility etc all of that stuff right everything that we've talked about is what's going to come up in the therapy it's what's going to be the problem right uh, and so um and that will help you to see your own stuff because the problem is if it's just you and the therapist the therapist only has to go off what you're saying now obviously if they're highly skilled they're going to be able to see through your delusions but it's not easy if you're in a group therapy session or a couples therapy session especially couples but this doesn't have to be romantic partners or wife this could be business partners this could be father and son or mother and daughter whatever like couples therapy can be any kind of intimate relationship not just romantic um then because that person knows you so well and because that person is so good at triggering you your ability to fool the therapist intentionally or not will be a lot less and so it will really help you to see where you're displaying narcissistic traits and it will really help the other person to see it as well and it will really help you to see things from each other's point of view which of course is the whole point that's what a narcissist doesn't do. They only see things from their point of view. They find your view, you know, stupid or ridiculous or whatever. So, um, yeah, I would say couples therapy is a really good way of um, helping to deal with your own narcissistic traits and the narcissistic traits in the other person if um, they are only traits and you are fundamentally, you know, capable of shame and capable of personal responsibility and capable of humility and these other qualities that we talked about um then i don't think there's anything better now of course reading about it listening about it learning about it like we talked about before recognizing in other people and not calling them out on it is a really good practice um, recognizing it in yourself and calling yourself out about it is a really good practice so saying to people oh i'm sorry i was being you know very uh, entitled there or I'm sorry I wasn't taking responsibility or whatever that's a really really good thing to do and what you often find is when you call out your own narcissism to someone specifically not generally because if it's generally it's all just theory and people often don't know what you're talking about but if you specifically say yeah in this case I made a mistake sorry then you know that's humility that's personal responsibility and then that helps the other person to do the same thing to admit that they make this mistake and apologize or you know if you've been um acting like uh, other people should you know believe or do the same things that you do and you realize that and oh i'm sorry you know and then it helps other people realize it so the best if you want to point out someone's narcissism in them in my opinion the best way of doing it is pointing out your own in yourself so they can see an example a role model of what that is to recognize a trait in yourself and to speak it um and and again this will indicate to you if the person is full-blown narcissist or not because if you keep doing that over the course of the weeks months and years and they start to f do that a at least a little bit as well maybe not as much as you maybe every 10 times you do it they only do it once but that's still a sign that they're getting it a bit if it's genuine if they never seem to catch on and if they only use it as an opportunity to you know devalue you or you know control you or or whatever then that's um you know another indicator oh just to go back to the um talking of the the four phases of the narcissistic relationship just to go back to the full-blown narcissist for a second <clears throat> you know when i said plan your escape and then ruthlessly execute can you guess which of the four phases it's best to do that in? When they have discarded you. Absolutely right. So the usual thing when you've been discarded, if you are obviously still buying into it, if you've fallen for it, is to obviously feel you know sad and disappointed and rejected and longing and all the rest of it. But now you go, ah, great. <laughs> it's a chance to escape. Opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and so this is one of the reasons why you don't want to uh, let them become aware that you know what they're doing because if you do that they're going to keep being in a winning over mode to some degree and so you're not going to get right. that opportunity to escape 
Now, what you can do is you can antagonize them, if you're, but this is obviously an extremely dangerous strategy. But you can do something that you know will make them discard you and then use the opportunity to escape. But this is the, that is the more dramatic way of doing it because um, you're starting a fight, you're starting drama and confrontation. Um, and so you may well feel more guilty for doing that. Um, you may think later, oh, it's kind of my fault because I upset them. Blah, blah. So it's not what I have done and it's not what I'd recommend. But if you really can't face any other option, if you can't make them discard you and you can't get them to leave you alone, then it's something you might want to consider. Right, because yeah. they can, because they will pursue you really relentlessly once you do the um, uh, escape. That's the other thing. If you let them, as I said, that's why I recommend, you know, move out, like have a lawyer, you know, restraining order, and, and <laughs> move to a different country if you can. Like anything you can do to create that distance, block them and everything um, is good because they will otherwise relentlessly you know, do whatever they can to try and get you back. Not, not probably not a pleasant version, especially if they're a malignant narcissist, right? It can be a lot of mm. blame and yeah. recrimination and guilt trips and accusations and threats and bullying and all the rest of it. But um, ultimately, it's the, it's all because they're trying to get you back. I mean, you know, with the unpleasant strategy, I think the idea is the unpleasantness will end if I just give in and go back to them, right? And so yeah. that's what they're doing. Plus as well, if it's um, if you're already so exhausted, you're already so done, <laughs> it might be like easier to just like, oh, just go back. Oh God, I just don't have the energy for that instead of like the long haul ahead of the escape. So you could see how it just, you know, you just get caught back in. 100% right. I'm glad you brought up that word because, you know, I've talked a lot about the stress and drama and stuff like that, but you're absolutely right. Exhaustion is one of the hallmarks of dealing with these people. That's one of the other things like narcissistic people do get exhausted as well because they ignore their bodies and they ignore their own feelings because they're trying to live up to this ideal that they believe they are. And so they also often get psychosomatic health issues like, you know, uh, issues based on repressing feelings. And they do sometimes get fatigue issues. But I more commonly see fatigue issues in people who are around narcissistic people and often who had narcissistic parents because it is uh, exhausting to be on that roller coaster and again as i said sometimes narcissists do push themselves to breaking point but generally they have a lot more um what's the word resilience persistence durability to stress than the victims that they're putting it through um, because they have such a high level of motivation to keep the attention coming and to keep their flavor of attention coming. Whereas you, as a normal person, are not as highly motivated as them. And so, you know, you're more likely to just oh, just collapse, right, um, with exhaustion. Whereas they will keep fighting for attention as if literally their life depended on it. They're in that emergency fight or flight um, feeling like in the same way that the predator correctly believes they'll die unless they catch prey, um, a narcissist feels like they'll die unless they keep um, getting adequate attention. And so that's why it takes a lot for them to feel, you know, collapse and feel exhausted. But it's common for us to feel exhausted being around them, uh, especially when you're no longer around them. When you're around them, you're on the roller coaster, and then afterwards you're like, oh my God, you know. Like a, like a, even a short phone call can often, you know, make you collapse because it's just so draining, right? Yeah, that's one one way to identify it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And not foolproof yeah. because, again, you could be drained because you, you could be drained because your own issues, right? This is always yeah, the thing. Yeah, so yeah. easy. And I, again, before we end, I want to strongly encourage people to not fall into the victim or self-pity as an identity um, in the same way that you don't fall into self-aggrandizement and self-importance as an identity, they both lead to ruin. They actually both uh, facets of narcissism, which as I'm categorizing it as a flavor of evil. You can acknowledge that horrible things were done to you without falling into victimhood, right? You can, it's just, it's, it's a fact that you've been abused. It's a fact you've been neglected. It's a fact that you've been hurt. It's a fact that um, you've been whatever, that you've been traumatized. You can acknowledge all those things as facts and acknowledge maybe, you know, your inner child. I'm sorry that you were hurt. I'm sorry that no one loved you and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You can do all that kind of stuff, but that doesn't mean you have to go into feeling like 
you are a victim in general or starting to feel like everyone is victimizing you. That's another potential trap to get into. And most importantly, don't fall into the trap of feeling like an innocent victim. Realize that you were involved in that. Now, the one exception to that is the parent, right? Because when you're born, you are innocent. And so you can maybe feel like an innocent victim of a parent, but anyone else you're partly responsible for, right? You made it happen. You fell for it. You were seduced. You were pulled in by, you know, greed or lust or, you know, envy or whatever it might be. You fell for it. So you're partly responsible. So you're not in, an innocent victim unless we're talking maybe about, you know, narcissist you had from the moment you were born and you're um, not a victim as an identity. You just had some horrible experiences. I think for some reason people use the word survivor because they don't want to identify with a victim. And I think that's a bit better, but it still kind of implies like struggle and hardship, um, which I think is not inaccurate necessarily, but it's just disempowering. Um, and so I think the thing to realize is, look, the narcissist loves you feeling like a victim. If you're feeling like a victim, you're not really out of the narcissist trap yet, even if you've got no contact with a narcissist in your life. The one thing the narcissist doesn't want you to be is you know, fully self-empowered with a strong sense of what you want, a strong sense of boundaries, you know, to easily be able to say no, to be really clear um, about what is and isn't acceptable to you, what you do and don't believe, what you do and don't want, what you do and don't accept, what you do and don't um, you know, dream about, dream for in your life, all of that stuff. That, they, that's what they don't want. Someone who feels like a victim is actually an easy target for the next narcissist to come along and go, oh, poor you, love bomb you, and you're right back in that cycle again. I think you also make a really good point here. It's like it always, there's that you know, saying, it takes two to tango. And, and then it can also be identifying, okay, well, what was it about myself that I got caught up into it? Was it a, you know, a lack of self-esteem or something like that? Are there things I need to work on or what can I do to empower myself to not be in that position again? And, and you know, take those steps because then you are on the road to, if you want to say recovery, but on the road to becoming more whole, if, if you'd like to put it that way. Absolutely right. I like the road to recovery. Uh, I want to film an episode about addictions very soon. And I would actually treat the relationship with the toxic narcissist person as an addiction um, in the sense it's very hard to quit. And we talked about this a little bit, how the stress and drama that they create is exciting. Um, and it's just like a drug high. And so quitting the narcissist is just like quitting a drug in a way. And even though I didn't do it myself, you know, I quite a big believer in the whole 12 step process, you know, like the whole and, and one of it is, you know, giving yourself one of the ones that's the most contentious about that these days is you know, giving yourself over to a higher power. Um, but I absolutely believe in that. Not that you have to believe in any particular higher power, but, you know, the very um, philosophy of materialism, like, you know, there is no such thing as a higher power is a narcissistic philosophy. It comes to me from narcissistic minds that to, to believe that there is no intelligence greater than you. <laughs> fundamentally is a very very <laughs> narcissistic idea or just even your species right still a very very narcissistic idea it's very human centric like there couldn't possibly be anything greater than us um and it's not normal you know all cultures throughout history whether they worship some abstract god in the heavens or whether they worship nature but you know um everyone was aware of something greater than them and, you know, uh, it's not just our philosophy, it's also, you know, we're so protected from the elements, right? Like when you're at the mercy of the elements, like the, the, the sky, the thunder and lightning seems like, you know, something greater than you. Cold, the force of cold seems something like something greater than you. The heat of the sun feels like something greater than you. You know, like uh, there are all these forces acting upon you that you're kind of helpless to stop that feel like something greater than you. So the amount of control we have over our environment is one of the factors that makes a narcissistic philosophy easy to believe. And I have observed that people who live in cities are much more likely to believe in a narcissistic philosophy about life than people who live in the countryside. And I think it's a similar reason. Not that the people in the countryside are that connected to nature, but they're still connect more connected to nature, like the natural cycles. Maybe they actually see animals on a regular basis in their natural environment and, and stuff like that. And they just have more of a sense of proportionality and not thinking that humans and human creations are 
like the you know greatest most fundamentally amazing thing so anyway yeah so being aware of a higher power i think is a crucial thing because the narcissist actually what they truly are and we talked about this a little bit earlier kind of they're a megalomaniac like they ideally no matter what type of narcissist we're talking about they would love to be your god not even just your boss or your parent or whatever right they 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 want to that your world revolves around them like you're the earth and they're the sun right you're the center of their universe and so it's again in most of those ancient religions to hold any human up as if they're important as important as a god is considered a fundamental sin right and but the thing is and you may think religion is superstitious nonsense and all the rest of it but human beings have an instinct of religion whether that is correct or not and so the problem is when we have no religion when we have no sense of connection to anything greater than ourselves often we do put a human being in that place to fulfill that role and often usually that person is narcissistic or psychopathic and that's really not a good thing you know so um it's I, i'm not saying to be religious but like to seek out something greater than yourself is an endeavor that a narcissist would never do so it's a good way of proving to yourself that you're not a narcissist and i do think it's one of the central precepts of giving up the addiction to the narcissistic person uh, and i would treat it as an addiction and also you know maybe you're successful maybe you do everything i recommend you have no narcissist in your life and then uh, you know whatever period of time a couple of years later and you end up getting together with one again right like, oh how has that happened or getting involved with one in some way how does that happen to me that's the same thing as you know quitting drugs going cold turkey having a whatever it is a two-year chip and then oh i relapsed like right. it's the same thing and you should treat it the same way which is oh it's a relapse that's okay i can forgive myself just the time starts again one day at a time starting now right like don't think oh well that's it then i'm just gonna have to live with these kind of people just like you wouldn't think oh well that's it then now i'm just an alcoholic i might as well just drink for the rest of my life just pick yourself up say oh well i did it again whoops but i'm an addict i can forgive myself and, and do the 12 steps again or whatever steps you did to get clean the first time the four steps i guess in my case i hope you're enjoying this episode i just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality affordable supplements that elwin and i personally use and that's feel younger what i love about feel younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers but the prices are very affordable you can call their customer support team 20 hours a day seven days a week and in my experience they're really helpful and friendly and what i love most of all as the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. This has been absolutely incredible. I have thoroughly enjoyed it and it has helped me look at things in a deeper way that I hadn't really looked at or considered. So I thank you for that. And just before we close, I just want to also just say, um, you know, do you have any other things, uh, final thoughts for our listeners that have joined us today? Yeah, please. You know, I know most YouTube accounts are anonymous. Please share in the comments, um, you know, your own experience. Do you recognize this in yourself? Do you recognize it in people close to you and what's your experience i would love to hear fantastic thank you ellen and thank you everyone that has joined us today we do appreciate you so please do make sure you leave your comments below we'd love to get back to you love to hear what you're thinking about what uh, experiences you have had so do reach out and please remember to hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss an, an episode and we'll see you next time hey i hope you enjoyed that video you may have noticed i recommended a few different videos in that episode and one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.